that what we perceive comes from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And that's something that's quite difficult to get, certainly for me, to get my head around. Evolution pretty much guarantees that we will not see the world as it really is. Uh, my point is slightly different, that we can't see the world as it really is. It doesn't even make sense. I mean, this is a very old philosophical point, goes right back to Kant. You know, this idea of the noumenon, the, the, the world as it really is, is always hidden behind what, what he described as a sensory veil. Um, and what we experience in this view then is this, as you said, this interpretation, this best guess, uh, in my terminology, this controlled hallucination. To the extent that we realize that our perceptions are constructions and may differ from one person to another, we can cultivate a bit more humility about our own individual way of perceiving the world. And mm. if we can cultivate a bit more humility about our own perceptual experience, perhaps we can cultivate a bit more humility about our beliefs and a bit more empathy with the perceptions and beliefs of others. So this isn't just an idle philosophical scientific exercise. I think it really has some social grip. everyone and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. So today we have the fascinating proposition that what we call reality is in fact a hallucination that we all agree on to consider. Now, we've already heard in this second series in episode 28 from physicist Paul Davies on the implications of Einstein that indeed matter is energy and as such that the world we see as solid objects and space between them isn't really like that. We've also heard from cognitive scientist Don Hoffman in episode 29 that we see the world in a way optimized for our fitness in the evolutionary sense, not for truth, i.e. not to see it as it actually is. So today we're going to find out from a brilliant neuroscientist that we are in what he calls a controlled hallucination. That neuroscientist is none other than Anil Seth, professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex. He's also the co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science. He's published over 100 scientific papers and is the editor-in-chief of the Oxford University Press publication, Neuroscience of Consciousness. And his TED Talk, Your Brain Hallucinates Your Conscious Reality, has more than 11 million views. Now, his new book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, which expands on most of what we're going to discuss today, is a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller and a New Statesman, Economist and Bloomberg Book of the Year. Now, I've wanted to speak with Anil since I heard about this theory, uh, as it seemed to match some of my worries about this disconnection between what we perceive and what's actually there and, and how much of what we see is coming from our own mental and biological state and our previous biases at the moment we perceive it. So without further ado, let's go. Dr. Anil Seth, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you? Thanks. It's a pleasure. I'm glad we managed to catch up after a few missed appointments. And I'm very glad to be here. Thank you so much, Adol. So I always love to start out asking about my guests' earliest conscious reflections, those first few big questions that might have come up either in adolescence or maybe even before. What big questions do you remember from that time that might have left an impression? I have a bunch of memories. Of course, I don't know how reliable they are because that's the thing about memory, right? The more often you recall something, the the more it departs from what actually happened. But I do have this memory of being at home in the, the house I grew up in and in South Oxfordshire in the bathroom and looking in the mirror and realizing, I must have been about seven or eight years old, I think, and then realizing that at some point I would die. I would die. Now, uh, that I would not exist at some point in the future, as I'd not existed at some point in the past. And this, from the perspective of like 40 years on from that, looking back, you know, I, I don't remember whether it was a sort of massive 
destabilizing philosophical realization or whether it was just, oh yeah, now I'm hungry and I'm, I want something to eat. But but I do remember a moment and perhaps that was the moment that I started wondering uh, more regularly about consciousness, about self, about what it means to be me, why I'm not somebody else. What does happen when I die? Where was I before I was born? I think we all have questions like this at some point when we're growing up, but mostly we get educated out of asking them because they don't really fit into the things we're taught at school. And I, you know, it wasn't that I was obsessed with these questions all through my life. I, I came back to them and eventually I found a way to, to think about them, work on them, write about them as a career, which I feel very lucky. Mm, well, that's a it's a pretty strong starting point, isn't it? So before we get on to your new book, Being You, uh, just to sort of set the scene for the listeners, also another a f- a few important precepts that we've been covering on the show as well. Now, one of your heroes, uh, our previous guest in this series, the influential neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, who has deeply elaborated on the importance of, of homeopath- homeostatic survival experiences, experiences like pain, hunger, sleepiness, in the evolution of conscious brains. And listeners do go back to that episode because he explains it beautifully in his very, very characteristic way. Uh, and you take this a step further, arguing that our consciousness is a, a prediction machine, generating our best guess of what's happening in the outside world. But this doesn't just come from the perception of the outside world um, coming in, as we might expect, but also from the inside out. Can you lay out how that works for us? Sure, I'll I'll give it a shot. You're you're absolutely right. Antonio Damasio has been a big influence on me for for more than twenty years, precisely because of his emphasis of the importance of the living body in consciousness and the primacy of things like moods and, and emotions in structuring our our conscious lives. And you know, Damasio's perspective on this stood in in quite strong contrast to a lot of research in consciousness certainly when I was starting out in, in the early two, late 90s, early 2000s, most people were focusing on vision because vision is easy to study, right? We can control what people see. We can contrast conscious visual perception with unconscious visual perception and, and so on. But studying consciousness through vision alone is a little bit like looking for your car keys where, where the light is. You know, it's It may be a thing you can do, but that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And, and Damasio and, and others too, including my old boss, Gerald Edelman and, and some others, really, and Yak Pansep, emphasized the, the importance of the body. In my way of thinking about it, what I ended up trying to do was sort of connect these two aspects of research into consciousness and try to think of both emotion and mood and our experience of being an embodied organism as a perceptual experience, as something that just enters our consciousness, but that is created according to the same principles as our experiences of everything else, including the visual world. And there's a particular framework for thinking about this that I found very useful, which is thinking of the brain as a prediction machine. The brain is locked inside this bony vault of a skull, and it's trying to figure out what's out there in the world or in here, in the body but it never has direct access to the world or the body. So to figure out what's going on, it has to make a best guess. It has to make a prediction, not about necessarily the future, but a prediction about the way things are now. And it uses sensory information, whether it's from the eyes or the ears or the heart or the liver or the lungs, to calibrate these predictions, to keep them tuned to the world. And so this is been variously called predictive processing or predictive coding, but it carries with it this very important implication that what we perceive comes from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And that's something that's quite difficult to get, certainly for me, to get my head around, because it seems as though if we if we go back to vision for a minute, you, know, you open your eyes in the morning and this world appears, and it just seems to pour itself transparently into your mind through your eyes and and your ears and so on. It doesn't feel like the brain is creating this experience through making predictions and calibrating them. But that 
is what I think, and what many others, you know, going back to Hermann von Helmholtz in the 19th century, have thought too, that our perceptual experience is carried by the predictions the brain makes and the sensory data is used to update it. And my main contribution, I think, theoretically, from papers going back more than 10 years and the book, is to apply that same framework to the body too, hmm. to realize that emotions and moods and experiences of the body are also the brain's predictions about sensory data, but with two very important differences. The first being that the sensory signals now come from the body, not from the world. And there's plenty of sensory information about the body that comes into the brain. Both Interoception. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in, so that's part. So, I mean, part of it is is standard extraception. We see our bodies. We, you know, we, we, we experience touch. We have proprioception. We know where our body is. But we also have interoception, which is this sense of the body from within. You know, Damasio emphasizes it. Bud Craig emphasizes it. Lisa Feldman Barrett emphasizes it. There's all these sensory signals that tell the brain about the physiological state of the body, you know, how well it's doing at staying alive. So that's one difference. There are sensory signals that are coming from a different place. The other big difference, and what I focused on, is what the predictions are for. So in vision, for instance, mainly we want to figure out what's out there and whether it's coming towards us or not and where it is in space. So that's what visual experiences are like. They have this character of spatiality. Right? Things appear in locations and they have they have colors and shapes and so on. But when it comes to perceiving the interior of the body, the brain isn't so much interested in where things are in the body or what shape they are. I don't care about the location of my liver or what it looks like from the outside, what the brain cares about is how well it's doing. And so it uses predictions not to figure out what's out there, but to control and regulate. Because once you can predict something, you can control it. So these predictions about the body from the inside are all about control and regulation. And that's why you know, experiences of the body are the way they are. We don't experience our internal organs in different places unless they're really hurting or something's gone wrong. We experience in general how well we're doing at, at staying alive. You know, are things going well or badly? Emotions feel good or bad? They Can you give us an example of that, Alan? Well, I think any kind of emotion is, is quite a good example. So, you know, if we feel anxiety, you know, what is that? It doesn't, you know, it, it sometimes superficially we can experience anxiety and relate it to something in the world that we think is the cause of that anxiety and there may well be some worldly cause of anxiety a missed deadline or some decision you have to make something but if you focus on what the actual experience of anxiety is it's often a very embodied feeling you know you feel it in your in your limbs usually uh, sometimes in other places of, of the body it's a perception of the physiological condition of the body. The psychologist William James told us this many, many years ago and came up with this idea. Uh, all I'm adding to the table is, is a mechanism for that in terms of the brain making a prediction about why the body is in a particular state in order to control and regulate it. And the idea is the flip side of the predictive regulation of the body is the experience of emotion and mood, whether it's anxiety or fear or, or pleasure. And you give a quite a good example of this, of the, you know, the false arm one. And that's quite an, a, a good example of that when we make a mistake there, because it's the threat system, it's, it, it, there's this risk of, of getting hurt and where maybe, uh, you know, we go into this with Joe Ledoux of the amygdala that's so fast to act, perhaps faster than, than we receive any, any sensory input or have chance to think about it. Give us that example of the false arm, because it shows the difference between something coming from the outside world and something coming from inside us, doesn't it? Well, it kind of does. I mean, it's more about a different aspect of experiencing the body. So, so we can experience the body from within, which is this this business of interoception. But then we also have a sense of the body as an object in the world. Like, I know that this hand is my hand. It seems very obvious that why should there be anything to even explain here? Surely the brain just knows what the body is. 
But if you think about it, why should that be the case? The brain, again, is locked inside this bony skull. It has to always make its inference, has to figure it out what, what is the body and what isn't. And it turns out to be surprisingly easy to trick. So the, the fake hand situation, usually called the rubber hand illusion, is a very good example of, of how you can trick the brain. In fact, I didn't realize I, I always keep a, a you know a rubber hand just to demonstrate. <laughs> what, for those what. for those of you listening on the podcast platforms, Anil now has a rubber hand. I'm not going to ask why he has one, but I'm sure it's for professional reasons. And of course it is. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that that if you put if you put somebody in a situation where their real hand is hidden from sight behind a cardboard screen, and the, this fake rubber hand is placed in front of them in a position that their hand might normally be if they were resting it on the table. And you get them to look at the fake rubber hand. And then as the experimenter, you take two paintbrushes and you stroke both hands at the same time. For many people, this gives rise to a rather uncanny feeling that the rubber hand is somehow part of the body. And this is a very weird feeling. It varies a lot from person to person, and we'll get onto that in a second. But what it shows is that the brain's conclusion about what the body is, is rather flexible, rather more so than you might think. You know, the standard story goes that the brain is seeing a hand where its hand might normally be. It's seeing this fake hand be touched, and it's also feeling touched because the real hand is being touched too. And so it reaches this conclusion that, oh, it doesn't look like my hand, but whatever. There's enough evidence that it ought to be my hand. That's the standard story. In work that we've been doing at Sussex, my university, for a while now with my colleagues, Peter Lush and Zoltan Dienes, we've actually shown that it's probably largely a hypnotic suggestion effect, you know, that you're setting up a condition where you're giving people a very strong contextual cue to experience something weird. Like you put this fake hand in front of them, you stroke it, you stroke a real one, you ask them like, so is this your hand? It's a very strong, what in psychology we call demand characteristic. People are being encouraged to have a particular experience. And it turns out that the more hypnotizable you are, which is something we can measure, then the more likely you are to have this rubber hand illusion experience. Doesn't mean it's not real. It's perfectly real for the people that have it. It just means it's probably coming, uh, again, more from the inside out, more from the top down. You know, we're giving people an expectation what to experience. And for some people, it, that expectation bites more strongly. But either way, it demonstrates that we should not take for granted our experience of what the body is. This is something that the brain is continually generating for us, and it can be tricked. I mean, we see examples in, in neurology as well. People with amputations often have something called phantom limb syndrome. Well, this is, Anna, this is exactly what I wanted to ask about, because um, on the show, we've discussed this in detail on the left brain interpreter, discovered by Mike Zaniger and Joe Ledoux, both who been on the show for listeners who want to get deeper into the the left and right hemispheres and and different emotions and the and the amygdala the left brain interpreter phenomena that similarly to how you describe sees our project our brain projecting its best guess of course onto perceptual information but it can make mistakes as you portray brilliantly in in this in in these examples these these optical and audio uh, uh, illusions now I've argued that while this is generally effective as a way of understanding the world based on past experience, body schema, etc., it has this high risk of tr tricking us into a sense of certainty because the brain doesn't remind us that it's formed only a hypothesis or a best guess rather than a certain truth. So this false sense of certainty about the world undermines our need to update and change our worldview when faced with new data. And on the contrary, we tend to go back to something that we had a preconceived idea about. So this, this idea coming from out of the person towards what's being coming from the, from the outside world. What do you take on that argument? Are we at risk of doing that? And therefore, shall we say, resisting uh, uh, the, 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 the new information that we're getting that contradicts our previous experience? 
Yeah, I think I think we, we really are. So one of the curious things about how perception works in this view of the brain as a prediction machine is that we don't experience it as being like that. And it seems to us that we just perceive the world as it really is, as if it pours itself transparently into our minds. We don't perceive in our experience the fact that there's all this under the hood construction going on. Yet that is is what is happening. I mean, take color for for, for a, a good, very simple example. I mean, Cezanne, the, the artist, said that color is where the brain and the universe meet. Color seems, when we experience color, it seems to be a mind-independent property of the world. But it isn't. You know, many different people experience different colors, different animals that experience entirely different worlds of color. But it nonetheless seems to exist out there independently of us. Now, certain things do exist out there independently of us. Objects have solidity. If you stand in front of a bus, it's going to, you know, that it's a bad idea. Buses move, they're heavy, they have volume and so on. But the way things appear to us in our experience is always a construction. It's always coming from the inside out. And a a consequence, there are two consequences that I think relevant to your point. The first is because we all have different brains, we're all going to have slightly different experiences, even if we're in the exact same situation. And we won't notice typically because the differences might not be sufficiently large that they surface in different behaviors or language, unless we unless they're really big, in which case we say somebody's hallucinating or they start behaving oddly. But most of the time, you know, if you and I are looking up at the blue sky in Brighton, we may have different experiences of blue, but we will never know this. Because A, the, the differences aren't necessarily that big, and B, because to your point, we have this certainty, this overconfidence that what we perceive is actually the way things really are. And um, one of, uh, if you allow me, a new project that, that I'm running with some colleagues at Sussex and Glasgow is trying to get at this because we don't know very much about how we experience the world differently. There's a few social media memes which have shown up, like that dress that half the world saw as blue and black and half the world saw as white and gold a few years ago. You might remember that. Some of your listeners might remember that. But in general, we don't know very much. This inner diversity, this perceptual diversity is largely hidden because it's subjective and private. We can't see it, but we, compared to external diversity, we can all see how we differ in size and skin color and so on. So we have this new project called the Perception Census, which is a set of online, simple little experiments and illusions and surveys that are fun, hopefully fun, for people to do, uh, that we're trying to get as many people as possible to take part in, to give us a first map of how we each experience a unique world. And this is scientifically, I think, very interesting. And it's quite ambitious, but it's no one's tried to do it before. Um, but I also think its message is quite important because it, to the extent that we realize that our perceptions are constructions and may differ from one person to another, we can cultivate a bit more humility about our own individual way of perceiving the world. And mm. if we can cultivate a bit more humility about our own perceptual experience, perhaps we can cultivate a bit more humility about our beliefs and a bit more empathy with the perceptions and beliefs of others. You know, recognizing difference is always a, a, an important prerequisite for communication and for building bridges. And if we all go around in our perceptual bubbles, just not aware that other people's bubbles might be different or that there are bubbles at all, you know, I think that that leads to a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication. So this isn't just an idle philosophical scientific exercise. I think it really has some social grip. Well, I totally agree. And uh, listeners, do check out that in the show notes. And if you want to volunteer your perceptions for this study, please get involved. Uh, this kind of science really does rely on the participation of us, the public. So, Anna, on to our main topic uh, for today, the controlled hallucination analogy. Now, uh, obviously, your popular TED talk, you put forward this idea, and it's become part of your theory of consciousness in your most recent book, Being You. So 
in episode nine of the first series, I had a fantastic discussion um, about the difficulty of changing our beliefs, something that uh, you were just touching on just there. Um, um, our beliefs about the world based on new information. And this was with your fellow scientist, Jonas Kaplan. And uh, I believe you've been on his podcast as well. Really, really fascinating uh, neuroscientist. And within that, we talked also about the interconnected nature of the world coming out of modern physics, rather than the separated world we perceive consciously. So, for example, if if matter isn't as it appears to us in our in our perception, as you described before, uh, we come to this famous idea of the best guess about the world. But that best guess, in that sense, is an interpretation, or as you put it, a hallucination of some sort, but not one that only I can see, but rather that we all see, or approximately so. So if psychedelic drugs or psychosis can create a complete hallucination, then quotidian day-to-day -day perception and conscious experience is a kind of collective or, or shared or controlled hallucination, as you call it. Now, this controlled hallucination is what we call reality. Tell us the steps of how you arrived to this idea and to this way of looking at the world. It's really a summary of what we've been talking about already, um, that our perceptual experience is not a direct, immediate, fully accurate, veridical reflection of what's out there. In fact, I don't think perception could ever be. Reality is not the kind of thing that can be directly perceived. You know, as, as you mentioned, we don't even really know what reality is, is it? Is it quarks? Is it superstrings? Is it interactions? Or is it very, very small things? Um, physicists will disagree about this. But what's clear is we don't perceive reality as it really is. We perceive it as it's useful for us to perceive it in order to survive. Right. Hoffman uh, said this in, in, ep in episode 28. He's talking about the fact that these are evolutionary payoffs. You know, we would only see what was good for us. That's right. I think Don makes the good point that you know, evolution pretty much guarantees that we will not see the world as it really is. Uh, my point is slightly different, that we can't see the world as it really is. It doesn't even make sense. I mean, this is a very old philosophical point, goes right back to Kant, you know, this idea of the noumenon, the, the, the world as it really is, is always hidden behind what, what he described as a sensory veil. Um, and what we experience in this view, then, is this, as you said, this interpretation, this best guess, uh, in my terminology, this controlled hallucination. And this is actually an old term as well. I heard it from somebody else. You heard it from somebody else. Everything has a history, right? I just so we it. don't know the origin. We don't know the right. first years. This wasn't William James or anyone. This wasn't William James. I heard it from Chris Frith, a British psychologist who heard it from Ramesh Jain, uh, uh, an Indian American psychologist. But it's been traced back. Actually, I. I didn't know it back beyond 1990, but I put a footnote in the hardcover edition of my book saying the trail goes cold because I tried to trace it back further. And what was brilliant was people who read the hardback immediately took it as took it on as a challenge. And within two or three months, I'd been able, with the help of readers, to trace it right back to the mid-19th century and a French writer who talked about perception is a controlled hallucination so it probably goes back even further than that well, I, I can't help thinking it's connected to a much older idea of maya in uh, in sanskrit i think there are going to be analogies uh, in, in 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 many different languages and many different cultures but the use of that term was what i was thinking specifically and the reason the term is important for me is because it emphasizes this continuity between what we typically think of as hallucination where where people experience things that others don't, whether it's on psychedelics or in schizophrenia, where you might hear voices that other people don't, uh, or, or in other situations. Um, and normal, as you say, quotidian, everyday perception, the here and now. We like to think they're completely different, but I think they're, they all lie on a continuum. Now, you lie back in, on a grassy field on a sunny day, look up at the sky, there might be fluffy white clouds, and you might see faces in these clouds. Where is that? I mean, those faces aren't really there. Our brain is projecting faces into the stimuli. So that's is that normal perception? Is that hallucination? It's somewhere in the middle. It's this 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 kind of perception that we talk about as pareidolia, seeing patterns in things. Um, so there's this continuity 
just as much as normal perception is controlled hallucination where our brain's best guesses are reined in by sensory signals then hallucination more broadly is uncontrolled perception where the brain's best guesses lose their grip on their causes in the world and so for me this is a useful phrase it unifies many different aspects of perception within this common mechanism where the brain's top-down predictions are balanced in some way more or less successfully more or less usefully against sensory signals coming from the world and the body so what does that mean for your theory of consciousness because um you know the 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 back cover of your book being used it's being put forward that this is quite a radical new theory of consciousness where do you differ from the colleagues that you you mentioned earlier in the interview i think by following the thread through uh, in a different way so the the first distinctive claim is that these top down predictions they don't just shape or mod, mod, modulate what we experience they are what we experience so that's one very distinctive you know, one very strong claim in there and then the second aspect is to say okay well if this applies to the world like my visual experience is a controlled hallucination based on sensory signals coming into my eyes as we've discussed my experience of self whether it's the body whether it's an experience of free will whether it's an experience of having a first person perspective these are also kinds of controlled hallucinations these are also brain based best guesses so it's taking this idea of the predictive brain and turning the lens inwards and then the final step is to recognize that or at least this is the proposal in the book that the origin of this predictive brain in the first place whether in evolution in development of each individual organism as it grows up and in the day to day life is fundamentally grounded in regulation of the living body so the reason we have this predictive circuitry that interprets sensory signals coming from the world is because of the the need to regulate the body to keep it alive so there's a very strong through line here that we can only understand conscious perception in light of the role of the brain in keeping the body alive now as i put it we we experience the world and the self with through and because of our living bodies and this is not a place that i expected to end up when when i started think about these ideas but it becomes for me the natural endpoint and it emphasizes a close link between our status as living systems as flesh and blood living creatures and consciousness as a biological phenomenon now a lot of other theories of consciousness treat our nature as living systems really quite arbitrarily you know many theories of consciousness suggest that if you wired a computer up the right way it would become conscious or that consciousness is to do with cognitive processes of some sort our ability to share information they treat the body more or less as a meat machine that moves the brain around from one place to another whereas i see it as very very fundamental in shaping all of our conscious experiences now this is entirely distinctive some of you are previous guests like um Antonio Damasio and Joe Dudas to some extent but and, and others too there's there's been a lot of people who've talked about the body as as very important um but i just have a, a view of it that, that sort of goes takes this lens of the predictive brain and uses that as a way to structure this connection and emphasize and uh, unpack how and why the living body is so crucial to our experiences of world and self that's interesting and and it's the the big question i think i can hear most of my listeners itching to ask is about reductionism here and this idea is ah so you're reducing all of this just to biological life but there's another fascinating point here similar to your point about the sense making coming from inside us primarily and what comes from outside comes through this filter of what of what's coming from inside is this concept of downward causation so we're more familiar with reductive sciences upward causation that describes higher order interactions like conscious experience and emotion for example as being caused by caused by lower level ones like for example the interaction of 
the brain with neuromodulators like dopamine or oxytocin or, or endorphins or something. But in fact, higher functions like the subjective perception of threat, for example, can then cause downward causation back to the chemical level, as shown in the brain-body bidirectionality of Stephen Porges's polyvagal theory. Mm. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, they can go back to episode five with Dr. Porges to learn about that. Anil, can you give us another example of downward causation from your research to illustrate that it's it's quite important that we understand that that bidirectionality? Mm, this is an interesting direction to go in. It's actually something that I'm working on quite a bit right now from a more mathematical perspective. Because you're right, the standard from scientific view is that it's all reductionistic, right? That we we take one higher level of description, whether it's something being alive or some sort of higher level organization, and we show how that's produced by the interaction of smaller parts. Um, this is a very powerful method in science, and we shouldn't deny that it's a very powerful method in science. But it's important to distinguish reductionism as a method from a claim about the way the world actually is. And, and that's interesting. Is there actually such a thing as, as downward causation? Can a, can a, a whole influence the behavior of the parts more than just the parts influencing themselves. This gets very philosophical. Does it even make sense? I think there are some interpretations of downward causality that don't really make sense that, that sort of say you get this some big thing comes in and changes how atoms behave at a very, very low level. It's very unclear how some readings of this might work. Uh, and it may, in, in some uses of it, it may just be a shorthand, right? We use higher levels of description as a shorthand to understand how a system worked. And, and that's that's uncontroversial. So the real question for me is, is there anything more than our use of downward causality and emergence, which of course is the the other side of the coin? I mean, we have a whole, is the whole more than the sum of the parts? Are these anything other than just convenient ways of describing a system? And my suspicion is that they are more than just convenient ways of describing a system, that a rich scientific view of systems should allow for causes that go side to side, upwards and downwards in all directions. There is nothing that sort of contravenes basic laws of physics in this. Um, or that one is primary to the other, perhaps. Well, that so... They need to be compatible. So there's this idea of supervenience in, in philosophy, which is that uh, things unfolding at high levels of, the, of description shouldn't contradict what's going on at lower levels. But it doesn't mean that the lower levels are always the most useful way to explain something, and especially not when you get these interactions between higher levels and lower levels of description and so we're working on i mean let me this is all getting a bit abstract so let me try and bring it down to a, to a concrete example and we'll go away from the body and consciousness for a moment and sit on the beach at brighton and look at a flock of starlings as they whirl around in the sky and settle down to roost on the ruins of the west pier now you look at this flock of birds it seems that the flock is an organization, an entity of itself. You know that it's made up of individual birds and there's nothing else but individual birds. But the flock seems to have a behavior, a mind of its own. You know, it changes direction, it splits, it wheels around. And the individual birds seem to be reacting to the flock, like they don't want to stray too far from it. They, they come back towards it. They, they remain part of the flock. So here you have a nice example where this higher level of description, the flock, seems to emerge from the birds. It seems to be just more than the sum of a bunch of birds flying around. And it also seems to influence what the individual birds do. So the question is, is that is there a sensible way to actually formalize that, to write it down, to measure it? You know, this is this is the trick in science. If you can measure something, then you're going to make progress. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there are there are ways to sensibly talk about and measure these kinds of things. You can measure how much knowing 
what the flock is doing tells you about what the individual birds do, how much information flows from the top down. And that's a kind of downward causality going on here. So if we can do that for flocks of birds, perhaps we can do that also for flocks of neurons, you know, neurons in the brain. If you look at them, it's they don't naturally exude flocking. Like we look at a flock of birds, it's very intuitive, but you, you open up a brain and look at neurons firing through some microscope or whatever. The, the large scale patterns don't reveal themselves so easily. But, but what we're trying to do, the hope is we can like sharpen our tools on things like flocking birds and then apply them to the brain and see if there's something analogous going on. Do we see emergence? Do we see downward causation? And if we do, you know, what, what does that help us explain? Does that help us explain, for instance, how a, a mental state, whether it's conscious or not, which is something that is more that it involves many, many parts of the brain at once, can a mental state influence what we do? You know, how, how does that relate to the firing of individual neurons that then control muscles? There's I mean, a lot of utility in taking these tools about downward causation emergence sharpening them in context where we know what's going on and then seeing what we can explain about the brain, the mind, consciousness and behavior with them. But it's a very, very big topic for sure. Well, it, it is. And I just want to just just push a little bit deeper into it. Um, now, one this idea has been brought to the fore by the South African physicist George Ellis, and he's saying this is an argument for dualism, that, that consciousness couldn't merely have emerged out of matter. He uses the example of higher order software downwardly causing changes in the hardware of a computer. Now, <laughs> are you a typical reductionist? Tell, tell us what, what does all this, because it sounds like you're still really considering it, what are the implications of this kind of idea for the emergence uh, argument? Because, because obviously that's where most people sit. That this is that, that that consciousness is just emerging out of ever greater levels of complexity in the brain. So I guess I'm a pragmatist at all these things. Like I like to be able to measure things and know what it is I'm measuring. So it's very easy to use words like emergence and just say, oh, yeah, consciousness emerges in some way from the brain. But what do we really mean by that? You know, this word emergence is doing a lot of work that's not usually unpacked very, very well. Um, so what I prefer to do is say, OK, there's a sensible intuition here that it seems as though conscious mental states emerge from the brain in the sense that there's lots of neurons and brains are complicated systems with many parts, yet conscious mental states are integrated and unified. You know, we have one experience at a time, even though each experience is very rich. And it also seems that our conscious experiences exert some functional role in, in what we do as organisms. So there's some sort of face value for thinking of consciousness as emerging. But to really see whether this is useful, then we've got to find ways of measuring things like emergence and downward causality. Uh, and really, that's that's been what I've done a lot of in my career. Previously, I was looking at measures of information throw, flow and and just normal causality in systems and trying to to apply them to real to both simulated systems of neural networks and real neural data. So it's. Maybe I'm not a typical reductionist because I don't think I, I think there is great value in looking at multiple levels of description and thinking about how they interact and trying to measure how they interact. But I think we can do that almost while sidestepping the really difficult philosophical question of whether these higher levels really exist in the same way that lower levels really exist. Now, that's a, a very controversial issue. And I mean, I'm tempted to say that they do, but I don't need to, to go that far. I can still just say there's use, there's utility. We can understand more about the mind in the brain by taking concepts like emergence seriously and trying to figure out how to measure them and apply them. And then, so I resist actually the kind of big conclusions that somebody like George comes to. I, mean, I, I know George, he's a brilliant physicist and a wonderful thinker, um, but I wouldn't use a claim about emergence to support a claim about 
dualism about whether whether consciousness can in principle be explained by the stuff that's you know, happening inside our skulls i think we often it seems as though consciousness can't be explained that way there's a there's an intuitive appeal to dualism but i sort of set that aside and say okay i'm just agnostic about that i don't mm. honestly know and Let's that's the way a cognitive it. scientist should work they should wait until we've got the data to confirm it either way and i rather like your um your holding off on coming to any conclusion about that that's i think a, a quite a wise way of approaching it especially when when you're an experimental scientist so you're actually looking for experimental data now, another important point here, again, about this sense of consciousness and that these being my experiences is something we discussed with Jonas Kaplan uh, as we and we discussed the evidence for the isolated self. And, the, and, and he came to the conclusion in inverted commas that the self was an, an illusion as we experienced it anyway. And it was just designed to help us survive in the environment in the similar way to your best guess system. In your opinion, to what extent is the self an illusion? And perhaps you can give us an example to illustrate your, your thoughts on this. The word illusion is a bit tricky. I think there's there's it depends on what you think it's what the contrast is. Mm. Right. When we talk about illusion, we usually assume there's some objective, more true, accurate thing going on that the illusion stands in contrast to and it's not clear to me what that is when it comes to the self there are there are some sort of fairly naive possibilities like this idea of of an immutable soul that's the essence of your personality that's just gonna leap from one body to the next and you know if that's the kind of self that you have in mind yeah that is that's not actually what's going on so if if we experience ourselves as being like that then yes that's that's illusory uh so i think the self is illusory insofar as there is no sort of essence of you or me that is unchanging over time always persistent apart from the rest of your brain and body and somehow inhabiting a different realm that that's not the kind of self that exists and we don't need neuroscience for that that's a very you know so that point has been raised in in buddhist thinking and many other spiritual traditions for a very very long time what the self is put it more positively as we've been discussing in my view is a is a collection of perceptions you know, we perceive the body from the outside we talked about that with the rubber hand illusion we perceive the body from the inside. We've talked about that. It's emotion and mood. We have a first-person perspective on the world, which is constructed. We know we can manipulate that in the lab, and people have out-of-body experiences. And then we have collections of memories and uh, and a sense of self that's shaped through social interactions, and of course, an experience of free will too. All of these things, collectively, we call self, but they're all different kinds of perceptions that are experienced as bound together quite loosely. And, and we know they come apart in all sorts of psychiatric and neurological disorders. And in the labs, we can tease apart all these different elements of self. So these perceptions are, are real in the sense that people have real experiences and they're related to things going on. They're related to the body and to the world. But there is no individual thing that is the self that underlies all of this. And in that sense, I agree with the claim that the self is an illusion. Well, listen, Adol, thank you so much for your time. Uh, wishing you very, very much all the best with the book. Listeners, do go out and take a look at that. And also check in with the new project. Remind me of the name of it again, The Perception. It's called The Perception Census. It's part of this larger project called The Dream Machine, where we used flickering light to give visual hallucinations to tens of thousands of people in the UK over this summer. But that's that's another story. But if you if you Google Perception Census or just uh, go through my website, which is anilseth.com, you'll find a way to participate. And it would be brilliant because we're really trying to get as many people to take part as possible. It's a real citizen science initiative everybody taking part really really does help well and it's it ain't going to be much of a collective hallucination unless we're all on board with it so uh, let's get into that listeners thank you so much Anil Seth.
Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure.